Good morning. Um, if you'd stand for the reading of God's word, I'll be reading Genesis 28, 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because he set, the, sun, the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up on a, as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me in this journey, and I am taking and, w- and, will, be gi- and will give me food, to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God, and his stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all of that you give me, I will give you a tenth. You may be seated. Well, as we jump into the story, we discover that Jacob was on the run. He was literally running for his life, and as he jogged along the trail, he... uh, he began to think back about what it was that got him into this predicament. See, as long as he could remember, he had been trying to get the birthright, the firstborn birthright. His brother didn't seem to want it, so he, he did his best to get it. He tried it with a pot of red beans, and then he finally accomplished it with a well-prepared meal and a few strips of goat skin. But look what it got him. He got the blessing, but here he was on the run because his brother Esau had threatened to literally put him out of his misery, i.e. Jacob's or Esau's, depending on your point of view. But his good old mom had decided to to lend a hand. She sent him off to her brother Laban under the guise of finding a wife. But the fact of the matter is he was on the run. He was literally running for his life. Well, he went as far as he could the first day. The the scripture says it began to get dark, and he looked for a place to camp. And and he decided that he probably shouldn't sleep too soundly because he didn't know what Esau was capable of. So he pulled up a rock for a pillow. Rock for a pillow, that's pretty comfortable, right? About as comfortable as some of these pews. Where's Cameron or Eric? (laughs) I stayed up too late. Anyway, during that night when he was sleeping on the ground with a rock for a pillow, he had a dream. But it was one of those vivid kind of dreams. You ever have one of those where everything is just, I mean, it, it, is, it has seemed so absolutely real. And, and the way that we knew it was more than a, a, a dream, it was a vision, is because when he woke up, he remembered it. Most of us don't remember our dreams very well, do we? And he realized that, that, uh, that God was in this place. It, it impacted him in, in a powerful way. You see, here he was. He, he knew the prophecy. He, he knew the scripture, and it came alive for him in a way that day. But, but he knew that the, 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 the prophecy was that there would be two sons, and, and they would both be fathers of great nations, and, and one would be stronger, but the older would serve the younger. He knew that. He had heard that story. And, and yet he, his, his mom and himself, when he was old enough, decided to lend the Lord a hand because they didn't trust him completely. Isn't it amazing how often we do that? We, we hear from God and we go, well, God, you need a little help. I mean, you don't know how it is in Moscow in 2023. God, let me explain it to you. Right? We try to do that. So they tried to do it. So he had, he had uh, schemed with his mom and he had bargained with his older brother and he had tricked his nearsighted and aging father and, and he had got the firstborn blessing, the father of a great nation, 
the one who was to inherit the family fortune and the name, and here he was on the run, sleeping on the ground with a rock for a pillow in a place called Luz. I think that's out past Fernwood, right? This is a great story. I love this story. Let's jump right into it. While he was there, in the midst of this situation, you have the picture painted pretty well, he had a vision. This is number one. In the midst of probably the lowest time of his life, the vision came and he came face to face with the living, loving God who gave him this promise. Let me read it again. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and the east, the north and the south. And all of the people on this earth will be blessed through you and through your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. So, So get the picture. Here is Jacob who's on the run, and he had heard this his whole life. But it was like a light bulb went on in his head. I think this was perhaps the first time that that this vision came to him in a very real and personal way. I mean, it had always been about Father Abraham or or Daddy Isaac, but now it was for him too. It it wasn't just something that was far away that he'd heard about and was going to happen sometime. It was right here, right now, inside of him. He realized that God was for him and God was with him. Then the promise, number two. Jacob realized the promise was his. It it wasn't just a story that dad told too many times around the dinner table. You guys have a dad like that? Or a grandpa? I hope I don't do that too much. They just repeat it over and over again. They said, yeah, hey, do you remember the story about the, oh yeah, we remember. It was for him. Something happened inside of him. Listen to him tell it in his own words. He said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. You ever been there? Hmm. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. There is none of, this is none other than the house of God, the very gate of heaven. And early that next day, Jacob took the stone, which he used as a, as, uh, as a pillow, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. And then Jacob made a vow. Do you remember the vow? If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, this is important, I will give you a tenth. Now this may seem like an add-on, something that's additional here, but you... This tells me that he was really serious. Do you want to know how to tell if someone's really serious about it? About a commitment or a vow? Is when they put their money where their mouth is. Right? I mean, you're serious if you're willing to shell out bucks. Because we like to have those dollars. If you want to see how serious someone is with their relationship with Christ, I mean, if they really are serious about it, see how it affects two things. Number one, their pocketbook, and number two, their calendar. We worship what we give our time to and we give our treasures to. From that point on, Jacob's life was totally different. God indeed blessed him even after dealing with his uncle Laban. You know, if you read the story about his uncle Laban, you'll find out that conniving runs in the family. But by the time he returned home many years later, he was wealthy. You see, there was no question that God was with him and God was blessing him. And he was well on the way to becoming the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so it wasn't just added, you know, Abraham and Isaac. It was added Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you want to read the whole story, do it later. It starts in, or continues in Genesis 25, 19 and following. You get the whole thing. It's a great story, Pastor. We like to hear about Jacob. Jacob had an encounter. You know, we've heard about Jacob. He's the father of the 12 tribes and all that. What does that have to do with me? Does it have anything to do with me? So this is the application. 
This was, uh, I can't tell you how long ago. It, it was several, probably a few years ago. I remember I was at home alone. Kids were gone. Laura was gone. I had some quiet time. I was sitting there reading a book. It was nice. It was warm. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you're reading the book. I, something was wrong. You could just, something just wasn't, just something was off. Do you know what I'm talking about? You ever had that feeling something's not right? It, it's like when you go into the forest and all of a sudden all the sounds quit. That's what it was. It took me a few minutes to, to realize that the electricity had gone off. And it was silent. You know, you don't realize how all those electrical appliances we have, they buzz and they click and they hum and they make noise and we're there. And then I realized it was starting to get a little bit warm. And then, you know, the mind starts to wonder, oh no, the electricity's off. Uh, if it doesn't come back on, the food in the refrigerator is going to go bad. And then, then, then we won't have TV. Oh my God, there's no, I can't watch the NCAA playoffs tonight. How terrible. It was just, it was just silence. And then God began to speak to me. Put the book as, isn't it amazing what God has to do sometimes to get our attention? Hmm. God began to speak. Here's what he said. We can grow so accustomed to the presence of God that we can take it for granted. You see, if God really is with us, there is a difference. Let me tell you this morning, there's no question that God is with us. And when God is with us, there will be a difference in our lives. And God forgive us for the times that we doubt it, and even worse than doubting it, the times that we take it for granted. You know, we worry about people doubting. I'm more worried about the people who take it for granted. I'm more worried about the people who abuse this relationship with God. They know that God has radically transformed them like Pastor Brian was talking about. God has come into their hearts and he has changed them and then they just go about their life as if nothing else had gone on. Hear me this morning. If God really does change you, there will be a difference. There will be. Jacob's problem is our problem. For those of us in the church, he grew up with the covenant. He'd heard it again, the story about how Abraham had, you know, grandpa had taken his dad Isaac up on the Mount Moriah and, and he was going to sacrifice him. And then there was a lamb or a ram caught in the thicket and, and, and God saved his dad's life that way. And, and, and he had heard how his grandfather Abraham was a hundred years old when he had his dad. A hundred. Imagine that. A hundred. And his grandma was 90. It just blows our mind. We think about that. A 100-year-old guy having a baby? 90-year-old woman having a baby? But it wasn't until this day, in a place called Luz, they changed the name to Bethel, which means God's house, that he really knew that God loved him and was for him. How often do... Do we come to church week after week? We go through the motions more from habit than sheer joy. We've done it so many times we can do it in our sleep and sometimes do. Hmm. God loves you. That's more than a motto. It's a reality that must be grabbed with both hands. If we, if we really get a hold of this reality, God will take us on a ride like we've never been on before. He wants to pour out his spirit on us. He wants to bless us until we say enough. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> I, I've never been there before. Maybe I've approached that. But I mean where God is blessing you in such a severe way that you're going, please stop. Can you imagine what that would be like? I can't take anymore, God. You're too good. I'm so excited, i got to quit. I'm going to start acting like Lon. <laughs> That's really blessed. God wants to walk these aisles. He wants to touch us. He wants to, to fill us so full that we'll never doubt that he's alive. That's what God wants to do for his people. Listen to me. All the time. I want you to do something for me, with me. Stop your, all the thoughts that are going on. That's hard to do, I know, some of us. 
and close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Let it out slowly and listen to what Holy Spirit will say to you. Listen as Holy Spirit, right now in this very moment, begins to flow through the body, his body, the church. And if we allow it to, when we breathe in Holy Spirit, it can give us spiritual oxygen that can fill us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. I want you to realize, maybe for the first time in a long time, maybe for the first time ever, that that God is here. He's here in this place right now. He's in the midst of us, and he is speaking to us. The last point is this, the word. His words to Jacob are his words to us today. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and his son Isaac. I will give you and your family victory in the land where you are now living. Your spiritual descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and the east, the north and the south. All those to whom you minister will be blessed through you and your spiritual offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will always bring you back safely to your home. I will never leave you, ever. And the great work that I have promised you, we will accomplish it together. Did you know that this place, yes, this very place, is Bethel? Which means house of God. You ever wonder why Spokane Bethel? That's where their name comes. This is Bethel. And if we could see into the spiritual realm... And I wish we could. Perhaps there'd be a ladder starting right here and going up into heaven. Can you imagine that in your minds? There's no question this is holy ground. It's not holy ground because I'm here or because you're here. This is holy ground because of God. He's here. In this place, wherever God is, is holy ground. It's no wonder that so many are unhappy, preoccupied, and constantly focusing on things that don't matter for a moment in the eternal scheme of things. It's because they don't realize that this is holy ground. And even more amazing, I've been on holy ground in Walmart. Or Winco. Because the word promises that where two or three are gathered together, he's in their midst. What can happen if we really begin to realize that God is with us and God is for us and God loves us? It's amazing how often we just go through the motions of worship. We go through the motions of the Christian life. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're good motions. They're, they're good habits. We should do them. They should become so much of a part of our habit that they become our default. That We do those, but, but God forgive us when we take them for granted. When we take them for granted. We're going to transition in a few moments. And share in communion. I want you guys just to pause with me for a moment. Father, thank you. I pray that today some eyes and some hearts would be open. I know there's been some some discussion and some concern about, about things that are going on in our church and in people's lives and all of that. And Father, all of that stuff is meaningless when it comes down to knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and to knowing that we have a relationship with God. My prayer is is that we would sense, that people perhaps would sense for the first time that God truly is here. Every time we come together, God is here, that, that we wouldn't worry about the stuff that we drag with us because God already knows about it and he's already got it handled before we ever bring it to him. 
I just, I pray that somehow in the midst of this today that, that we would sense and feel your presence in a mighty way, that you would work your way deep into our hearts. And, and I pray that there would be a blessed assurance that would flow into hearts and minds today. For those who truly know Jesus Christ and who invite them into their hearts and minds. And I, I pray equally, Father, that there would be a blessed struggle for those who are not right with you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work as only you can work and that you would, you would wind, wind your way, wind your way into our hearts, that that Holy Spirit wind would blow and, and that we would sense and feel the desire to let the stuff go, like, like Pastor Brian talked about, let the, the things that we do that, that may seem like little things, they may not seem like they're important or big things, but anything that is not in alignment with your design and your will for us is sin. And we would let it go. We would just let it go. And invite you to come into our hearts. You, Holy Spirit, to blow through us and work in us.